Alright guys, what is up? This is a video I've been wanting to make for a while that's essentially just some of the tips and tricks I've kind of figured out over time in regard to building a durable and reliable quadcopter. I'm going to take you through some of my favorite parts, frame considerations, the biggie. I think the, the biggest thing for me that took forever to figure out was what the crap to do with my antennas, both my video transmitter antenna and my S-Bus receiver antennas. The S-Bus receiver antennas are tiny and they kept getting chopped up and it was just a mess. It took me forever to figure it out. So I'm going to turn you guys down this way and uh, let's check out some of the quadcopters. Here are kind of my current quadcopter builds. This one over here on my left, this represents the first five inch quad I built. I recently rebuilt it um, and I'm calling this the kid quad. This weekend I'm going to Kansas City and uh, taking a friend of mine's son who's been starting to fly a little bit and I built this for him to race. And then also for my girls, if they wanna go out and fly, I've built this thing to be a tank so that they can you know, fly it and I don't have to worry about it much. So, so let's start with this one and uh, what we got going on here. So let's get in here. More so than a specific frame or a specific layout or anything like that, props or parts or whatever, I wanna to talk to you more so about concepts and build processes that you can pretty much implement on any frame. So first off, when I first built this quad, one of the first things I noticed was the top plate kept failing. And so I actually had to order another frame to get another top plate and then I ordered another frame to get another top plate and then my father-in-law Grumpy Steve actually suggested one day because I had all these extra <laughs> bottom plates why don't I cut the arms off of the bottom plates and use the four mil bottom plate as a top plate so um, that's actually what we got going on here if you can see so this top plate when it comes from the factory, it's actually about half that thickness. Since I had all these extra bottom plates laying around, took the Dremel tool to it, and I made myself a four mil top plate. The other thing I did with the construction of the frame, this frame, and it's it's a very budget, cheap frame. I did buy some different standoffs. I don't think you necessarily have to do that, but one thing I think you absolutely have to do is get longer screws and I haven't found it yet, but I will try to find and link in the description um, what that thread, you know, pitch and, and count is, I guess. These screws, the ones that come with it, like barely go into the standoff. I mean, just barely. These screws go about a third of the way down on each side. So they're nice and strong because when I would crash, that's what would fill. Is these standoffs would strip out and it'd be a big mess. So that's something that I think is definitely worth doing is getting longer screws for your standoffs. The next thing that I think is a pretty big deal is how your stack mounts. I don't have much of a stack. My stack is one board. We can get into that later, but your stack this, there, this makes it easier. For whatever reason, all of the frames, it seems like, and all of the boards come with like nylon standoffs. It doesn't take a hard crash for those things to strip out and fall apart and be a big mess. So one thing I did that I think you absolutely have to do is I actually got machine screws and there's a link in the description. You can buy them from Amazon or at you know Westlakes and Lowe's, it's up to you, but just buy a gigantic box of them. Uh, you'll use them eventually. I have two different sizes I purchased. Obviously they're both four mil screws with uh, I don't know, they call them 4-40s. I bought some that are 3 fourths of an inch long. They work well in my racers. And I also bought some that are one inch long, which are great for this one. And then uh, just a box of the little lock nuts that, that go with those. So, so my stack is supported with those. Now, one thing that's all the rage, and I wouldn't say it's hype train, but you absolutely have to soft mount your stuff these days. Um, this quad, I don't have the motor soft mounted, but I'm just running multi-shot. I'm not trying to run D-shot, but my flight controller, and this flight controller specifically is, in my opinion, the only flight controller you should ever buy, unless you're beholden to KISS or race flight or whatever, but I, just, I don't know why you would do that currently with you know, where the technology is. That could change. This is August 2017, so if you're watching this in the future and you think I'm stupid, then uh, just keep in mind, you know, what today's date is. But anyway, you have to soft mount your flight controller. Now, my flight controller comes with these really sweet grommets. I believe the race flight boards do as well. Flight controller in its construction is soft mounted. But getting your standoffs, what I did in here on this one, just I didn't need a ton of space underneath and I wanted it to be 
a tank. So I literally used a couple of those um, lock nuts as kind of standoffs underneath the board. And then I've got the cushion soft mount. And then if you need to soft mount or you need some other type of like cushioning, I bought this at Westlake's here in town, Westlake's Hardware, but I have a link in the description you can get from Amazon if you want. This is fuel line. It looks like what works perfectly great is a fuel line that is quarter inch outer diameter and an eighth of an inch inner diameter. And you can get this stuff for, you know, a couple bucks a foot. I think on Amazon it's 25 feet for like seven bucks or something. I paid too much locally. Go figure. You can cut that into like almost any height you want. Let's get in here. Just so my nuts didn't short out anything on the board, I've got a little bit of that uh, fuel line sandwiched in there and it's it's relatively soft and it uh, works pretty good. So that, in my opinion, is the only way you should do your stack. Um, don't use that nylon crap. Like, that just doesn't make sense to me. The next thing I wanna talk about that I think is a huge deal is your receiver antenna. So the way I have this set up is my flight controller and my PDB are all one board. I'll tell you what that is later. It's a big surprise. You might already recognize it if you're into this stuff, but I mean, it's the best flight controller on the market, hands down. I use the FreeSky XSR S-Bus receivers and that's sandwiched right on top here. I just use some double-sided sticky tape to stick it right there to the board and uh, totally love that. But that's sandwiched in there and then my antenna wires from that, I kind of run around here to the side across the arm here. So if you look at it from above, if you're trying to do like long range fly to the moon and stuff, like this probably isn't gonna be the solution for you. But if you wanna kinda of fly around and uh, do some racing and stuff, in my opinion, hands down, this is the only way you should ever mount your receiver antennas. And essentially what I've done, be completely fair and honest, I don't know who I got this idea from. I'm sure it was not my own. I was scouring the internet for something and like a week after I started doing this, uh, Joshua Bardwell, he posted his video and he's doing this on a chameleon build. But in my opinion, this is the only way you should mount them and what I've done is I've got a zip tie here that I literally just wrapped around the arm just like so. I ran the receiver wire over the edge of it and I covered it in heat shrink and I burned it. I melted it down. I added another piece of heat shrink and I burned it and I melted it down. The heat shrink thing, the zip tie thing, that's not new. Now putting it here is new and that's what's the big deal is putting your antennas right there. Now, all the hype train and stuff, you know, everyone kept saying like, you gotta put your antennas back here out the back and they gotta be at 45 degree angles and stuff like that. But I crash a lot and I crash a lot upside down. And I would crash upside down and my quad would be spinning and my antennas would bend up and just get chopped to crap. Just an awful, awful thing to always be replacing them. The reason it's so key is if you land upside down, well, obviously they're not gonna get chopped at all. If you land right side up in the perfect storm for antenna decimation, let's say you fell on a GoPro housing and it bent it all the way up. Like, look at this. It still doesn't, can you see that? That antenna is bent all the way up. It still doesn't get in the props. Like that's huge. These antennas cannot get chewed up. Now given, if I had three inches of antenna poking off the back of the quadcopter like this, yeah, I'd probably get better, you know, reception and less fail safes. But for racing, I have zero issues with this setup. It works flawlessly for me. So that is the biggie right there. The next thing related to antennas, antennas were always the roughest part, was what on earth do you do with your video transmitter antenna. Most of these frames, this original top plate, it's ignorant, I don't know why they did this, but they literally had like a little bubble out here that you could put your SMA antenna through and then it would just like stick up right here. It was always breaking. Just absolutely always breaking. Breaking the pigtails, breaking the antennas. That's where the top plate would always break. I actually started doing this on one of my other builds. On my racers, I actually typically put this on the bottom plate. On my racers, I've been putting my video transmitter under my stack, obviously I can't do that here, and then running the pigtail out. Essentially the same get up, but instead I zip tie it to the, to the bottom plate, kind of hanging out the back. If it's bendy at all, I just bend it down a little bit. This one, because I have a top plate, I went ahead and mounted my video transmitter. I literally sticky taped it to the top plate, zip tied this here antenna. This one isn't the greatest, but it, it works. It'll work for the kid quad, but uh, I stuck it there and uh, 
yeah, it can get banged up, it can get mashed up, but it can't get in the props. It literally cannot get in the props. And uh, put a lot of force to it, you'll break these zip ties, but that's it. So, but yeah, those are the big tricks and tips. 210 style frame. So these ESCs, I just have in heat shrink. Before the race tomorrow, just to protect it a little more, I'm probably gonna put some prop over it. If you haven't seen that trick, you take a, a prop, you cut it down, you put the prop over the ESC, and then you just tape it up with black electrical tape. It kind of gives a little shield to the ESC, that works great. But that's this quad, that's how I would build. Um, this style quad with a top plate. Let me take you through kind of my progression then. So from this, this is my racer that I started using most recently and uh, it's got a pod on it. I like this pod specifically. It's got a place to zip tie a GoPro. It's a racer, it's light, but if I wanna stick a GoPro on it, it's kind of ready to go. A lot of the same stuff applies here. So my receiver antennas right there look at that can't even get chopped up I had initially made this pod out of pla which it actually worked great but if i hit something hard it would literally just explode um and then i got into printing tpu having this tpu pod on here has made this quadcopter like literally indestructible it just bounces off of crap all the time also related to bouncing off of crap i have reversed my prop direction so all of my props spin outward i think this matters because if you hit the vinyl on a gate instead of your prop like sucking it into the quadcopter and getting tangled up in here your prop literally like bangs the gate away from yourself so on this one I got my XT60, this is a bottom mount battery, so the battery goes underneath, but my XT60 is just zip tied there. I've got my Triumph antenna, kind of hanging down the back there. Out of the way, this one's a little bendy, so I can bend it. It does get tapped by the props every now and again, but uh, that's why it's nice to have this one. This build has worked for me really, really well. This is the GEP Chimp. It comes with a full like top plate and everything, but I thought it was garbage, and um, that's why I stopped using it. But what I really like is it is a four mil unibody frame, and it is super stiff. Look at that, just absolutely super stiff. The edges are all cambered and stuff. It's expensive, but it's a good frame. If I had it all to do over, I would probably buy the uh, the spec frame, the Hyperlite Evo, but that one's not really conducive for a pod. And that's how I've been running this one. With this pod, it's pretty heavy, about 330 grams, but it gets around well. I really enjoy it, it's durable. I've never broken a frame with this. Trying to get on the lighter is better hype train. I have ran a few of my racers naked. This quad and this quad are literally built the same. It's just, instead of having this big black pod, I have this piece right here I 3D printed that actually mounts under the bolts for my stack screws. That's why it's important that they're tough. And then it gives a spot for me to mount my camera. In here I've got the XSR my video transmitter on, this one's got the Immersion RC Tramp in it. It's it's fine, but I still prefer the Unify, it's lighter. And then I'll go ahead and tell you about the flight controller. Here you go, guys. The only flight controller on earth I think you should buy is the DYS F4 all-in-one flight controller board. And that's what I've got in every single build now. I had tried the Betaflight, the BFF3 board. It was an all-in-one board, and I really liked all the features of it, but I literally ended up with a graveyard of three dead ones. I wanted to stay in that same neighborhood, so I went ahead, did some research, and came across this board. The reason this board, I think, just trumps everything else is it's an all-in-one, so you don't have to have a power distribution board. All of your ESCs, your power, your power leads, and everything go straight to this board. Secondly, is it's got a built-in OSD. OSD stands for on-screen display. So when I'm flying, I can see uh, telemetry info. I can see uh, what my you know RSSI is for my controller. So I uh, you know I'll know if it's getting weak. I can see how long I've been in the air. I can put my name on it, which is actually pretty important if you're racing. Um, that way people know who they're watching. You can keep track of the voltage of your battery. That's probably the biggest thing is keeping track of the voltage of your battery. This DYSF4 board is hands down the only board that makes sense to me. Race flight, I get the impression that their stuff flies really, really well. Their boards do have the rubber grommets. They don't have an onboard OSD. And to me, that is the kicker. You absolutely have to have an onboard OSD. So for the FPV cameras, I literally just switched to these Runcam micros. So I can't say a ton about them for the longest time. And 
in this build over here, I've got the Foxier, I think this is like some knockoff brand, but it's the HS1177. That camera looked great, worked great, it's just big, and it's actually kind of expensive. The knockoff versions are like 22 bucks, and then you have to buy a lens to get a wider field of view, which is actually pretty important. This Runcam Micro, this sucker is only 30 freaking bucks and it comes with a nice wide angle lens on it. I think this is gonna be my GoPro, <laughs> not GoPro, go-to camera for all my builds now just because it's uh, lighter. It is a little harder to mount because most of the camera mounts are made for, you kind of see how that camera mount's bending a little bit. Most of the camera mounts are made for the HS1177 size cameras. So, you know, you got to get a little creative. So like that when you can see the little, those little arms are pulling in a lot. Over here, I literally had to drill a hole through the TPU because that's the original mount back there and that would have been too far in. And this has to do a little bit with being durable, I guess. I typically cut a piece of motor foam and just stick under the camera to help it hold its position because there's nothing worse than flying along and your camera just tilting down. Uh, that's my builds. I have put links to pretty much everything that I talked about here and uh, a bunch of stuff we didn't necessarily talk about, but just my recommendations for gear in the description. So feel free to click those links. They are affiliate links. So if you buy something from Amazon, uh, they'll pay me and that's cool because uh, I like to get paid for stuff. I have nothing against online shops. I actually really like buying stuff from Twisted Quads. They're based out of Des Moines, which is just about three and a half hours north of me. Here, let's do this. So if I buy something from Amazon Prime on Monday, I buy something from Get FPV on Monday, and I buy something from Twisted Quads on Monday, I get the stuff from Amazon Prime on Wednesday, I get the stuff from Twisted Quads on Thursday, and I get the stuff from get FPV Friday or Saturday. So that's honestly why I buy so much stuff from Amazon. It's just easy. If you've got to return it, they don't typically give you flack and, and stuff like that. So that's it guys. I hope this helped you out. Feel free to uh, post a link to your build in the comments and let me know what you think. I'll probably do some more content in the future about my favorite parts. This video is already like 10 times longer than it ever should have been. All right guys, we will catch you later. Woot! <laughs>